Hello, Nuggets. Welcome to the lesson on symbolism and allegory. As you are writing down your heading, symbolism and allegory, and today's dates into your notebook, let's take a minute and review where we've been already with symbolism. So last class, when we learned about our Symbol Shield project, we talked about how symbols occur when one thing or one object, one item, represents something else beyond itself. So for example, we talked about how a light bulb could represent an idea or an invention. We talked about how trees can represent family or growth or wisdom. Those are just a few examples. When you created your symbol shields for today's class period, you did this on your own. You thought of different things that you wanted to communicate about yourself, and you represented them symbolically through using pictures. We talked about how companies do this when they brand objects. They do this through their logos and in their advertising so that they can communicate their values as a company and hopefully the way that they want us to feel about a certain product so we buy it. Today we're going to turn our focus back onto how symbolism works in literature. So we'll be learning specifically about symbols in short stories and also in novels. And in particular, we're going to look at a special genre called an allegory. So at the end of the lesson today, you should be able to define, recognize, and explain symbolism, allegory, and figurative versus literal language. Let's get started. First, I think it's always important to address the why. Like, why do authors do this? Do they do it just to make our lives difficult or be annoying or be pretentious? No, they definitely have reasons. And let's talk about what the three main ones are. And you'll notice they all work together. So one reason why authors create symbols or use them in their writing is that symbols allow authors to add these extra layers of meaning. Uh, you can see I put a picture of an onion over here on the right side of your screen. You may remember in the movie Shrek, when, he, when Shrek says to the character Donkey, you know, ogres are like lay onions, they have layers. Symbols are the same way, and we've learned about that in the previous class period. So my first bullet point relates to the second bullet point. What's the effect of these layers of meaning? It means that the author can really communicate a lot more using less space or without explaining or going into as great detail as they might have to to explain something more complicated. Okay. And that relates, in turn, to the third bullet. You know, a lot of the great themes in literature relate to emotions or feelings or morals or beliefs or ideas. You can't see those things. So symbols allow us to take something that's super abstract and maybe pretty complicated, and authors can communicate it in a way that's more familiar by comparing it to something concrete. So what do I mean by concrete versus abstract? Well, take this classroom wall for example. Concrete, you can touch it, you can smell it. it smells like concrete and paint and dust. If you even wanted to, you could lick it, you could taste it. But my point is this, the concrete physically exists. You can physically experience a wall of concrete. Abstract ideas, on the other hand, do not physically exist. For example, jealousy. You might be able to hear someone saying jealous words. You might see a jealous person give someone else a jealous, dirty look. But when it really comes down to it, can you actually see jealousy? If I asked everybody in this room to give a physical description of jealousy, all right, describe it for the mugshot, everybody in here would describe something different. And that's because jealousy doesn't physically exist. You can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't pick it up and throw it across the room. Jealousy is an idea, it's an emotion. You might be able to see the effects of it, but you can't actually see it. We would say that that is an abstract idea. Another good example of an abstract idea might be love. For example, you might be able to see two people who are acting in love. You might be able to see two people kissing because they're in love. You might be able to read the words of a love song. But guess what? Those are just representations of love. You can't actually see love itself. It doesn't have any weight. It's not a certain color. You can't touch it, taste it, smell it. 
pick it up and throw it across the room. Love is abstract. So what authors will do is they will speak figuratively in ways that their readers can connect to more easily. And they do that by comparing these abstract ideas to things that do physically exist. So for example, love is often compared to a red, red rose. Well, why does that figurative comparison get made all the time? Well, love is beautiful and it grows, but it can also be painful. Ella, the thorns on a rose. So just a quick review, symbols do three main things. They add extra layers of meaning. They allow authors to communicate a lot of information in less space. And they help take things that are difficult to visualize and make them more concrete so that we can relate to them more easily. Now, every short story that you read is not going to be full of symbols. Most of the time, a short story might have one very important symbol, maybe even two, on a rare occasion, three. But most of the time, everything that you read in a story is not symbolic. That would just be overkill. The exception to that is a special type of genre or type of literature, and that is called an allegory. An allegory is a special story where the characters, settings, and actions stand for something beyond themselves. Now, the last part of that definition, an allegory, stand for something beyond themselves, that should be ringing a bell with you. Because, of course, and you see it here in red, that is exactly what symbols do. Symbols stand for themselves, but they also represent something beyond themselves. So another way of defining an allegory is a story where everything is a symbol, okay? Everything's a symbol, the characters, the settings, and even the actions. So an allegory is a very interesting type of story. One of your roots uh, from your vocabulary was ambi. Allegories can be ambiguous. Do you remember what ambi means? That's right, it means both. And allegories can be interpreted both ways. You can read them literally, meaning what you see is what you get. It's a literal meaning. It's straightforward, and you don't read into it at all. Or you can read it figuratively. If you're reading it figuratively, you're looking beyond what the surface of the story is and looking to see the deeper meaning that's hidden behind it. We do this all the time when we speak. We say things literally, and we say things figuratively. For example, let's say I've been wandering around the desert for the last 10 days, and my body is starting to shut down because I haven't consumed enough calories, my internal organs are failing, and I'm going to pass out because I haven't had enough sustenance to keep me alive. If I said I'm starving, well, I would mean that literally in that scenario. I am literally starving if I hadn't eaten for the past seven days. I am dying of starvation. I am starving. That is a literal statement. But most of the time when you hear people say that, maybe it's while they're waiting for a meal, most of the time people are saying that figuratively, meaning people aren't literally starving. They're just saying that they are. So if I say, oh, I'm starving, I'm not really going to perish. But I'm saying that because I'm trying to emphasize just how hungry I am. So allegories, in the same way, they can be taken both literally and figuratively. And you'll understand this a little bit better after we look at some examples. <clears throat> Before we look at an example, there are two other aspects of allegories that are important to hit on. The first is that allegories are oftentimes uh, associated with different types of religious traditions all over the world. And the reason for that is allegories are intended to teach a moral lesson or make a comment about what's good and what's evil. Um, just think of all the stories that you read when a kid. It was, very, it was very obvious to see who the good guy was or who the bad guy was. The other thing that I want you to be aware of is that allegories, generally their symbolism operates one of two ways. The first way that a story will be allegorical is the characters, the settings, settings and situations. They can all be used to symbolize ideas or moral qualities. So like you might have a character who represents honesty, or you might have a character who's bad who represents dishonesty. And those sort of help to communicate the moral of the story. 
Here's one example. Do you remember when you were a kid, did you ever hear the story of the grasshopper and the ant? Well, if you haven't, here's how the story goes. The grasshopper parties and plays all summer long. He's just living life to the fullest. Carpe diem. Parties on. Never worries about tomorrow. And he makes fun of the poor little hapless ant who spends all summer walking around gathering food and stockpiling it. The grasshopper just can't understand why the ant is so lame, why he can't get a life. Well, summer ends, fall passes into winter, and poor old grasshopper, who liked to live it up in the summer, is now starving. He has nothing to eat, and he's cold and miserable, and he's afraid of starving to death. Whereas the ant, who prepared and used his time wisely, is all snug as a bug in a rug. Now, this is a good example of abstract ideas or moral qualities. Because, of course, all right, the grasshopper represents laziness and somebody who does not plan ahead. Whereas the ant represents the value of hard work and the value of preparation. It's a good example of a fable um, that is also an allegory. The last type of allegory, which we'll talk about when we uh, talk about Animal Farm, is a story where instead of representing ideas or character types, everything in the story actually represents something or someone who is actually real. So history people often really enjoy reading allegories because they enjoy figuring out sort of who's who and how the literal story lines up with the actual history behind it. And that's the way Animal Farm and a bunch of other allegories operate. At this time, um, you're going to exit the presentation and watch a short YouTube video based on Aesop's fable, The Fox and the Grapes. As you watch this video, keep in mind that I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. This story is purposefully geared towards an audience much younger than you, maybe pre through K, three to five years old maximum. And the story is going to reflect that. It's goofy and it's definitely made for kids. But it's not as simple as it first appears. This simple fable from Aesop is a great example of a story that uses symbolism in an allegorical way. So as you watch this story, I want you to be thinking about the story literally, what is literally happening in the story. And then I also want you to think about the story symbolically. You're going to see three things in the story. There will be a fox, there will be some grapes, and there will be a tree. At the end of the video, I want you to be able to answer the question, what do you think the grapes represent or symbolize? What do you think the tree represents or symbolizes? And what do you think the fox could symbolize or represent? What you just watched was a good example of a fable. Now you should be familiar with this term from last year in eighth grade. A fable is a type of allegory where this, the animals are symbols and they're used as characters. And they teach a moral lesson and they usually focus on virtues and vices. So did you have a good discussion about what the tree, the grapes, and the fox represented? You might have said a bunch of different things, because remember, symbols are subject to interpretation. Different people can view them in slightly different ways. But if you said anything close to the fact that the grapes represent goals or ideals or dreams, you could have said that the tree represents life or represents obstacles that get in the way of those goals or dreams. And the fox, of course, is the person who gives up when he feels like it's too hard and then more importantly makes excuses um, and pretends that he never wanted the goal or the dream in the first place. Another classic example is that of the tortoise and the hare, a story we all know. And of course we know the moral is slow and steady wins the waste, race. So this is, can be considered allegorical because the tortoise, who is slow and steady, represents perseverance and endurance. Whereas the hare or the rabbit represents cockiness and arrogance. So here you can see how these simple animal characters have an extra layer of meaning that adds to a rather simple story giving a complicated message. These are especially useful for communicating with children, right? 
Because if you lecture a three-year-old on not being arrogant or on having perseverance, the three-year-old is not going to be interested in what you're going to say. In fact, he or she probably isn't even going to understand what you're saying. But any three-year-old, four-year-old, or five-year-old can listen to the story and still understand those layers of meaning through the symbols. Alright, Animal Farm is an example of a novel that is an allegory. And this is a classic example of a novel where everything in the book has a historical connection or historical equivalent. So, for example, um, the two main characters, the pigs in the story, both represent real-life figures um, in post-revolutionary Russia. Napoleon, with his evil guard dogs, represents Stalin and the secret police who went after and made Stalin's enemies disappear. Snowball represents Trotsky, who was originally Stalin's partner. Stalin later killed him off because he had too many ideas and was a threat to Stalin's power. Over here in the upper left, you see a horse pulling a very heavy weight. Boxer is a workhorse in the book, and he's uh, one of the most beloved, lovable characters in the book. He believes in the revolution. He believes in the good that Napoleon claims he wants to accomplish. And he literally works himself to the bone, almost to death, trying to make that dream a reality, even though Napoleon's actually lying to him the whole time. Boxer represents the Russian peasants, many of whom who died and starved to death under Stalin's regime. So Animal Farm is one great example of a fantastic work of literature, that really is an entire allegorical story. There are many, many allegories out there besides Animal Farm. Uh, you might be familiar with The Emperor's New Clothes or The Emperor's New Groove from Disney, The Wizard of Oz, The Boy Who Cried Wolf, even more recent movies like Avatar, The Road, The Matrix, and Of Mice and Men, which you'll read in sophomore year. Allegories are very common because they're easily understood but they can communicate very complex and sometimes difficult subject matter. Today you're going to be reading an allegory about the Holocaust called The Terrible Things. So the key question that I want you to keep in mind as you are reading is why did the author, whose name is Eve Bunting, why would an author choose to express ideas symbolically or with symbols rather than literally? Okay, so for example, to, to go with our previous example of Animal Farm, why would George Orwell choose to write a book about animals on a farm who overthrow their farmer because he abuses them? Why wouldn't he just write a book about Stalin and the awful things that he did in Russia? That's an important question to ask, and it's an important question to bear in mind as you read the story for today. Take a minute in your notebook and jot down the answers to the following questions. These don't have to be long answers, but you should answer each one with at least a complete sentence. So here are the questions. Number one is an association question. Number one asks, when you hear the phrase, terrible things, what does it make you think of? Question number two, if you could choose only one and you had to choose just one, not both, which is more important to you, freedom, or safety. Number three is a little bit more complicated. This is an ethical question. Number three asks you, would you be willing to turn in a friend or a relative to the police if he or she had not committed a crime, so they weren't in trouble, but the government asked you to? I'll read that one through one more time just to make sure we understand it. Would you be willing to turn in a friend or a relative to the police if he or she had not committed a crime, but the government asked you to. Number four is sort of a morbid question. What things or people in your life would you refuse to give up even if your life was threatened? So not, not to be graphic, but let's pretend, you know, like someone has a gun to your head. What would you refuse to give up? What would you refuse to compromise or budge on? even if you were threatened. Number five, all right, if the zombie apocalypse happened tomorrow, what items would you deem necessary for your survival? What would be the bare essentials 
you would need to survive. And number six asks you to consider, would you speak up if you saw someone being treated in a manner you felt was inhumane? Why or why not? Inhumane uses the root in, which means not. So what this is literally asking you is, would you speak up if you saw someone being treated as though they were less than human? Take a second, pause this, and write down your responses in complete sentences. Now, make sure everyone in your group has a copy of Eve Bunting's story, The Terrible Things. Make sure as we read that you're following along, that way you can improve your reading comprehension. Remember, to read, you must look at words. I recommend that you read along with the paper in front of you, not with the screen, as the text will be very small. Terrible Things, An Allegory of the Holocaust by Eve Bunting In Europe, during World War II, many people looked the other way while terrible things happened. They pretended not to know that their neighbors were being taken away and imprisoned in concentration camps. They pretended not to hear cries for help. The Nazis killed millions of Jews and others in the Holocaust. If everyone had stood together at the first sign of evil, would this have happened? Standing up for what you know is right is not always easy, especially if the one you face is bigger and stronger than you. It is easier to look the other way. But if you do, terrible things can happen. The clearing in the woods was home to the small forest creatures. The birds and squirrels shared the trees. The rabbits and porcupines shared the shade beneath the trees. The frogs and fish shared the cool brown waters of the forest pond. Until the day, the terrible things came. Little Rabbit saw their terrible shadows before he saw them. They stopped at the edge of the clearing, and their shadows blotted out the sun. We have come for every creature with feathers on its back, the terrible things thundered. We don't have feathers, the frogs said. Nor we, said the squirrels. Nor we, said the porcupines. Nor we, said the rabbits. The little fish leaped from the water to show the shine of their scales, but the birds twittered nervously in the tops of the trees. Feathers, they rose in the air, then screamed away into the blue of the sky. But the terrible things had brought their terrible nets, and they flung them high and caught the birds and carried them away. The other forest creatures talked nervously among themselves. Those birds were always noisy, old porcupine said. Good riddance, I say. There's more room in the trees now, the squirrel said. Why did the terrible things want the birds, asked little rabbit. What's wrong with feathers? We mustn't ask, big rabbit said. The terrible things don't need a reason. Just be glad it wasn't us they wanted. Now there were no birds to sing in the clearing. But life went on almost as before until the day the terrible things came back. We have come for every creature with bushy tails, roared the terrible things. We have no tails, the frog said. Nor do we, not real tails, the porcupine said. The little fish jumped from the water to show the smooth shine of their thin tails, and the rabbits turned their rumps so the terrible things could see for themselves. Our tails are round and furry, they said. By no means are they bushy. The squirrels chattered their fear and ran high into the treetops. But the terrible things swung their terrible nets higher than the squirrels could run and wider than the squirrels could leap, and they caught them all and carried them away. Those squirrels were greedy, Big Rabbit said, always storing away things for themselves, never sharing. But why did the terrible things take them away? Little Rabbit asked. Do the terrible things want the clearings for themselves? No, they have their own place, Big Rabbit said. But the terrible things don't need a reason. Just mind your own business, Little Rabbit. We don't want them to get mad at us. Now there were no birds to sing or squirrels to chatter in the trees. But life in the clearing went on almost as before, until the day the terrible things came again. Little Rabbit heard the rumble of their terrible voices. We have come for every creature that swims, the terrible things thundered. Oh, we can't swim, the rabbit said quickly. And we can't swim, the porcupine said. The frogs dived deep in the forest pool 
and ripples spiraled like corkscrews on the dark brown water. The little fish darted this way and that in streaks of silver, but the terrible things threw their terrible nets into the depths, and they dragged up the dripping frogs and the shimmering fish and carried them away. Why did the terrible things take them? Little Rabbit asked. What did the frogs and fish do to them? Probably nothing, Big Rabbit said. But the terrible things don't need a reason. Many creatures dislike frogs, lumpy, slimy things. And fish are so cold and unfriendly, they never talk to any of us. Now there were no birds to sing, no squirrels to chatter, no frogs to croak, and no fish to play in the forest pool. Nervous silence filled the clearing. But life went on almost as usual, until the day the terrible things came back. Little rabbits smelled their terrible smell before they came into sight. The rabbits and porcupines looked all around, everywhere, except at each other. We have come for every creature that sprouts quills, the terrible things thundered. The rabbits stopped quivering. We don't have quills, they said, fluffing their soft white fur. The porcupines bristled with all of their strength, but the terrible things covered them with their terrible nets, and the porcupines hung in them like flies in a spider's web as the terrible things carried them away. Those porcupines always were bad-tempered, Big Rabbit said shakily. Prickly, sticky things. This time, Little Rabbit didn't ask why. By now he knew that the terrible things didn't need a reason. The terrible things had gone, but the smell still filled the clearing. I liked it better when there were all kinds of creatures in our clearing, he said. And I think we should move. What if the terrible things come back? Nonsense, said Big Rabbit. Why should we move? This has always been our home, and the terrible things won't come back. We are white rabbits. It couldn't happen to us. As day followed day, Little Rabbit thought Big Rabbit must be right, until the day the terrible things came back. Little Rabbit saw the terrible gleam of their terrible eyes through the forest darkness, and he smelled that terrible smell. We have come for any creature that is white, the terrible things thundered. There are no white creatures here but us, Big Rabbit said. We have come for you, the terrible things said. The rabbit scampered in every direction. Help, they cried. Somebody, help! But there was no one left to help, and the big circling nets dropped over them, and the terrible things carried them away. All but Little Rabbit, who was little enough to hide in a pile of rocks by the pond, and smart enough to stay so still that the terrible things thought he was a rock himself. When they had all gone, Little Rabbit crept into the middle of the empty clearing. I should have tried to help the other rabbits, he thought. If only we creatures had stuck together, it could have been different. Sadly, Little Rabbit left the clearing. He'd go tell other forest creatures about the terrible things, and he hoped someone would listen. And that concludes our story. Now, on a separate sheet of paper, make sure you put your name, your period number, and the date, and you're going to answer 1 through 10 in complete sentences. You do not need to write down the question. Pause this video until you're ready to continue. Now that we've read the story and taken notes, and hopefully you've had a great discussion about this story, let's see how much you really know and try to answer each one of these three questions on that separate sheet of paper. Be sure to answer in complete sentences. You do not need to write the question, only your answers. So number one, in your own words, what is a symbol? Number two, in your own words, what is an allegory? And last but not least, number three. Number three is worth double points. It is worth 50% of this classwork assignment. It says, why can Eve Bunting's terrible things be considered an allegory? Be sure to explain your ideas and prove that it is an allegory. If you have any questions about symbolism or allegory or about the theme of the terrible things, please see me in class. See you soon, Nuggets. Bye.